I was getting a little concerned here. It's like one minute. I thought, uh oh. <laughs> people... Now people usually come after. I'm yeah. usually here a minute or two before. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what have you been up to lately? I actually wanted to ask you that question. It's more interesting because I don't really know you other okay. than I've had one experience with you that I, I really got the sense that, um, I don't, not professionally speaking, but internally, I got the sense that you were very creative and into the idea of writing. And that interests me because that's my interest. All right. Well, I will tell you and Gil a very crazy idea that I'm, that I got about three days ago. That's why I'm here, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I may have to tell the story again. So you're going to hear it, you know, okay. more than once, but you know, I've been, I've been really, uh, there's so many upsetting things in the world, right? I mean, you know, climate, you know, we could just go on forever with just that. But uh, what was happening in Afghanistan was really uh, bothering me in a, in a both human tragedy way and also in a kind of a, if you will, literary way in the sense that, okay, here's the Taliban again, you know, they're back. <laughs> you know, you've spent all this money, they're back. And they're not just back, but they're like way back. Like they're trying to, set things back to 700 yeah. roughly you know in terms of their concept of what a good society is yeah. and what a uh, muslim society is and i just happened to know <laughs> because i read parts of it there's a solomon rushdie book i think it's called the princess of uh, florence and it it's fictional but it's got a lot of factual material in it about um akbar the great Akbar the Great was a Mughal or Muslim leader of India around the 1500s. And unlike, you know, very much unlike the Taliban, he went out of his way to say, hey, you know, listen, Hindus, you want to have a ceremony? Fine. Christians, you know, that's okay. That's okay. But in fact, I like debates. I'd like to have debates in my kingdom, you know, so that we have, you know, multiple points of view. And, and of course, we're going to have dance and music. I mean, who would, who would take that away, right? John, so, when, when is this? Uh, 1465 to 15 something or other. Okay. Uh, roughly corresponding to Renaissance Florence, because there's a weird connection between the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's Solomon Rushdie, so he's got weird mystical elements, like Akbar has a mystical mistress in addition to his physical ones he has an imaginary mistress however when he wakes up in the morning he has scratches on his back from having made love to his mystical mi mistress and you know he's, he's deliberately playing with your mind and he's kind of like you know well is it real is it mystic you know blah 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 anyhow i said okay look this is the guy if you're going to bring somebody back who's going to be a wake-up call to the taliban it's akbar after all his father or his grandfather established a Muslim center in Kabul, right? And now he's, he's, his, his own background is, is kind of mixed. It's, it's more Persian than it is Pashtun. But I mean, clearly he was, he was cosmopolitan in his outlook and his, you know, his, his attitude toward ethnicity. So, you know, you do it as a fantasy thing. You just say, okay, here he is, he's back. And then I thought, let's make it a little more interesting. Let's have a, um, it's, it's ambiguous whether it's an actual visit from a dead Muslim leader or it's a very high tech conspiracy by some very smart Sufi technologists who are in Pakistan. <laughs> so I have him, you know, he, he kind of appears, there's a little shimmer over in the, near the window in the Taliban meeting. And, this guy appears and he says, you know, congratulations. You, you've, uh, you know, Kabul is now, you know, it's, it's under Muslim control, which is good. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I think the idea you have of what that means is just not gonna work, you know? And he kind of opens up a little portal and he shows them some scenes from uh, 1490 India, which there's dancing and there's women not all completely covered up. And of course, the Taliban, they're no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, and he says, well, I'm going to give you some time to think about this. I'm going to be back in a couple of days. And here's what I want you to do. Um, you'll notice we've got a bunch of burqas over here in this little closet. And uh, I know that you can't 
if you put on a burqa and you, and you pretend to be a woman, you can't go out alone. So you're going to be divided up into threes and you're going to have a little assignment mm. to go out into Afghanistan, two burqa covered Taliban men and one Taliban man as the person who you have to have. You have to have a man with you. And he, there, he sends them out, you know, to like a birth clinic and, a, you know, he sends them out to these places where they're going to encounter the prejudice against women and uh, and the cruelty. And if if they come out of, you know, if they reveal who they are, that's a big embarrassment. They're, they're not going to want to do that. And uh, I, I imagine that there's like at least one, maybe two, who are so resistant to this idea that they just won't go along with it. And um, I'm debating in my own mind whether they would get an involuntary stealth dose of hormones, the type you would take if you were transitioning from male to female. I don't know, that's a pretty, a lot of people draw the line at that. That's, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. You know, but I mean, I, I'm just, I'm still, you know, I've only a couple of days I've had this idea. I'm working out the, working out the plot and the details, but also I realize I got to do a lot of work. I mean, I've got to contact not only practicing Muslims, but probably Muslim scholar. Fortunately, there's a good one at Berkeley who knows this period of Indian history. John, is this, uh, is this a novel or a movie treatment? I think it's, I think it's a short story because I'd like to get it out fast. Yeah. And, um, It'd be great if it was a movie and I don't want it to, it could easily turn into a novel and I don't want it that. I mean, I'm working on a novel and it's, it's yeah. long, <laughs> it's a long slog. Right. I don't want to, you know, put that one aside, get this thing out, even if it's sloppy, because it's very uh, timely, you know, and it'll, it'll stir up discussion. It might get me a fatwa. So I got to be a little careful. There's always that risk, but you yeah. know, all of us are in fatwas all the time. Um, the the only concern I have with your story is that if this guy showed up, um, they would probably do to him what some Christians would do to Jesus if he showed up. Well, see, he doesn't really show up. Okay. He, he appears as a as a hologram, uh, and they start looking for the projectors, but they can't find the projectors, so they're not sure. You know, he he shows up as a wavy, non you know immaterial thing, and he claims that he's a spirit. And they say, well, yeah, right, spirit. And they start looking for the projectors, but they can't find them because the, uh, the Sufi technologists, well, we, we're going to leave it open, you know, as long as you can, you, you keep it open. Is he, is he a, a spiritual being or, or are there Sufi technologists? You don't reveal that that's who's actually behind it until close to the end. I just figured, they OGM. Have no I, I, I figured OGM is behind it. Yeah, <laughs> it would be an interesting OGM project, a little bit more aggressive. Than what we're typically up for. Time, time's call for bold action. <laughs> so anyway, those of you who came in late uh, or came in early on time, actually, uh, and you wonder what in the heck crazy thing you stumbled into, this is an idea I have for a uh, short story or, as Gil suggests, maybe a film treatment on uh, the Taliban encountering a figure of Akbar the Great, who was a leader of Muslim India around 1500 and was very open-minded, uh, got in trouble actually for, for encouraging debate, encouraging diversity and all those things. So that's kind of like my check-in. <laughs> John, it, it, it may be a distraction, it may be helpful, but you want, might want to look, um, uh, read around in 12th century Spain in the golden yeah. age in Cordoba where there was also a very advanced open, um, um, you know, um, 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 Muslims, Christians, Jews plan together enormous intellectual and artistic development. I don't know what the relation of that to the India guy was, but it's an, it's a, it's an echo of a similar kind of time that you're writing about. Probably, a, a, on the one hand, a better example, as in closer to what we would identify with as a true yeah. cosmopolitan. The thing about Akbar is he passes the test of Muslim hero because yeah. he conquered India. You know, they, they know I'm not messing around with this guy. He's he's like, a, you know, but as a conqueror, he thought it was important to preserve cultural diversity. That's the that's the weird mix uh, that means he's a candidate to show up for the Taliban mm -hmm. as their coach. Yeah. OK, so anyhow, that's that's my crazy idea and my check in.
and welcome everyone and uh, thank you for showing up um even if you if you didn't know <laughs> that jerry wasn't going to be here but if you did now you if you didn't now you know jerry uh, asked me to, to step in so um we we can do our standard kind of uh check-in and go around in order but maybe first is there is there like a a pressing issue not the taliban in kabul is there is there an issue that's so hot that or so messy and significant that anybody would like to bring it up for general uh, conversation uh, before we start doing the check-ins. I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah, right. that's true. That's true. There are so many. Um, I just give it a second. There's a cat, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, we could we could just. Um, if anybody wants to go, wants to volunteer, you can let me let me know. Otherwise, I could go in order. And actually, on my screen, uh, Stacy, you are first. You can pass if you if you're if you want somebody else to go first. But what do you think? Well, well I'll just okay. say on a par parallel note to what you were talking about, because I think we're all thinking about the state of the world. But with Afghanistan in general, I had just been thinking about the idea of Pashti musicians, sort of priming the population so i was it sort of reminds me of what you're you know it's in the same direction of how can we use art to sort of change things a little bit <laughs> that yeah. was it humanize it okay great Pashtun musicians just kind of start playing in defiance of the uh, rules something like that oh, okay uh if going on my screen uh next person would be uh gil Good morning. Good morning. Um, the main thing that I think about Afghanistan these days is that it's out of our hands. Yeah. Uh, we will have no influence on what happens there. I don't know who will have influence. I don't know if Pakistan will. I don't know who will. Um, and, you know, given what a small minority the Pashtun are of the whole population, I don't imagine it's going to be very stable. Right. Right. And um, yeah, and so like the, the mental cascades that come from that are kind of scary. Um, where to start? Let me start here. I've been um, I, I, I've been reading in, in a group a book called uh, Before European Hegemony um, yeah. by Janet Abu Lugod, um, um, written in 1989, and it's it's a window into 1250 to 1350. Uh, so mm -hmm. before the rise of Europe. And the description yeah. of a very substantial global system of the time uh, with trade between Europe and the Middle East and China and India, uh, rich trade routes, um, you know, significant cultural differences, uh, window into the episodic uh, uh, not rise and fall, but kind of advance and retreat of China, mm -hmm. which is in certain periods very engaged in the world and in certain periods withdrawn from the world. Um, they're building an elaborate trade network. They have a Navy at one point of like 3,000 ocean going ships, some of which are big enough to hold up Nina, the Nina the Pinta and the Santa Maria on the deck of one of these ships. And so they're this formidable force. And at some point they pull back because the Confucian perspective that trade is just like indecent. Um, and so you have this, and, and, and um, you know, and the, the Muslim world is trading with Europe, but sees Europe as pretty backward and uninteresting culturally. Uh, we're talking about feudal Europe of the, of the Middle Ages, pre-Renaissance. Um, and so it's a picture, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of a view into, in, into the contingencies of history. Right how what we take for granted is a possible world that might not have been this way had China not withdrawn, um, had certain differences played out between the Middle East and Europe. At one point, they, they, uh, they stop, they move from trading through Venice and Genoa to the Champagne fairs of Central and Eastern France to going out past the Straits of Gibraltar and coming up to Bruges in Belgium from the Atlantic and picking up the textile trade from there and therefore, you know, the, the, the French uh, inner cities just sort of decline. So it, for, for me, um, it's, a, it's sort of an exploration of um, 
of, of the, uh, uh, how to say this, the non-inevitability of the world that we take for granted. The contingency, uh, yeah. The contingency, well, you know, first of all, is the rise of the West in the, six, in the what, 16th century, the, you know, the growing domination of Europe. Yeah. Uh, and the emergence of, of the extractive colonial empires of the West, Portugal, Spain, England, Netherlands, United States, um, in contrast um, to the more Mughal style empires of the East or, and, and many variations of that. Right. And, and the dominant mood for me is that the past, you know, what, 50, 70, 100 years, 72 of which I've lived that I take for granted as this period of progress in human history, uh, increasing globalization, increasing inclusion, increasing justice, one might argue, increasing awareness, uh, which I've always lived in with the assumption that it's a trend that will continue. Uh, I'm now more and more understanding that it's a trend in the midst of lots of trends that go up and down and up and down over the centuries and the eons. And it's, so it's a much more sober perspective on where we are now, um, both less confident, but also a, strangely a little bit less fraught, mm -hmm. you know, that things may decline in, in relation to our values and moods right now, but they have done that before and they have risen and fallen and risen and fallen. And so sort of my, my perspective on change is, 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 is broadening into larger times, yeah. timescapes. Right. And, and on a good day, that, that helps me be more serene in the face of all the turmoil. Not disinterested, not disconnected, but you know, a little less less angst ridden. On a bad day, I'm full of terror. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, you know, with with climate, the most direct example of that, uh, creeping fascism, you know, being the other more direct example of that, and in particular in relation to climate, and this is a bridge to what Klaus may talk about. Um, um, let me say this a different way. Um, um, I'm finding that as the ideas that many of us have been working to advance for decades start to get more and more acceptance into the mainstream, or at least recognition in the mainstream. I mean, climate issue, uh, which we were being laughed at 20, 30 years ago, is now on the table in every board meeting in the world. Um, I'm more and more aware of the inadequacies of the views that we have been selling. Yeah for want of a better word. So now we have people saying climate is the existential issue of humanity right now. And I think, well, wait a minute, actually not. It's critical, but behind that, you have the collapse of ecosystems and by the right. okay. and yeah. soil systems and hydrological systems, which people aren't even thinking about for the most part. Uh, and it's of course connected to the climate story, but um, I'm sort of you know in this, in this mode of now peeling the layers and wondering in a very specific way, how I talk to my clients. And what do I say? Do I say, great, you're doing ESG, or do I say ESG is bullshit, you need to be looking here. Um, and I had a first test of that yesterday. I did um, at 4.55 a.m. yesterday, I did the closing keynote of an ESG summit in Mumbai um, for the CII, the Conference of Indian Industries, um, which are jumping on the, on the climate and ESG bandwagon in what appears to be a pretty significant way. Uh, and I raised this challenge there about, you know, there's, you know, op open the curtain to climate and see the, the rest of the stack of the mess yeah. uh, that's there. And so I'm, I'm in the question of just how to, how to think about that, how to speak about that, how to engage people on that, what to offer uh, in my professional face to the companies and governments and so forth that I work with, um, um, how, how to, um, I've been sort of, I've been, I'm sorry, I guess this is long, but let me just say one more thing. I apologize for the length, but you sort of, it's triggered a role here. Um, I've been looking a lot at the offers that I make in the world and I've, and, and, and I'm, and I'm experimenting now with the notion that everybody knows the term trim tab here, yeah. right? Um, I'm experimenting, experimenting with the notion that my role now may be to be a trim tab to trim tabs. Right. To work with and coach people who have that role in the world of being trim tabs in their world. And maybe there's something I can bring to them to help move the game forward just a little bit. Um, okay. 
So that's my check-in. Thank you. Um, Thank you for real, listening. Just real quick, um, I, I'm reading this book called Sand Talk, and the uh, author talks about us as uh, second second people, <laughs> you know, he, or second nations. You know, he takes the, the, the term that's used in Canada and Australia, first nations for indigenous. He's, well, then all you other people are second nations. All of you arrived, there was somebody else there, and yep. you kind of shoved them aside. So, you know, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, you got a point there, you got a point there. They also look at uh, history much more cyclically um, than we do. Okay, thank you for that. Now there is some kind of a clicking going on. I stopped my mic uh, just to see if that hear it now. Possibly it was it was Gil. Anyway, yes, well, is there clicking now? Yeah, it came back. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was worth it to hear what you had to say, Gil. Anyway, thank you, <laughs> and. Uh, Mute is fine. Does anyone, <clears throat> we got a small group here. Does anyone want to volunteer to go next or shall I just uh, pick someone? Well, I'll go in, uh, to volunteer to go next, even though I haven't figured out what I'm going to talk about. Um, it seems to me that with climate change and all the efforts around it, uh, most people are hoping for something that would be an add-on to where we are that would take us to a slightly better world. But in fact, we're probably going to go through some really rough spots. And the future looks much more like a game of Go or chess, if you don't know Go, uh, with lots of players going in different directions. It's hard to coordinate across all our pawns as to what we're going to do. Uh, I'm pretty convinced that we... Uh, that the, the key issue in my mind is how to get the leverage to open up the oil companies to stop exploration, to stop pumping, uh, to stop selling. And then the way society copes with the fallout from that, uh, because there are going to be a lot of people who are hurt and we need a new kind of welfare system uh, to cope with the people who are dislodged by what are necessary moves. Now, the question is, how do you get those necessary moves? So I've been playing around with scenarios. I'm not happy with any of them, but here's one. That middle managers in organizations all over the world start talking to their bosses, the CEOs, about the need to do something. And the energy behind that gets to the point where a few CEOs step forward and say, we've got to really do things differently. And we've got to organize to stop the oil companies. Uh, so if you've got a handful of leaders from different organizations willing to coordinate uh, and to uh, lead a policy that looks a little bit like General Motors going into World War II uh, to reformulate all of our production st strategies. Uh, and it would take a lot of uh, moxie to uh, force people to do the changes that are necessary. But we've got to do that. And the only way to do it is to have a leadership team uh, that's willing to take on that task. I don't think it's very uh, likely that it will happen and we'll probably just keep dribbling on towards disaster. Anyway, that's my thinking. Okay, thank you, Doug. Quick question. I, I noticed it's a, it's a very much of a supply side uh, question meaning let's let's get the suppliers of the bad energy to to change their behavior and i'm i'm guessing that that's you know about that and that's intentional but uh less hope for the for the demand side you know iron air batteries i mean there's a whole bunch of things you know changing utilities changing uh policy. i think all those things are too slow uh-huh and that the demand side is where the mom there's a lot of momentum behind the current demand structure that we have that's harder to change because it's individuals who at the local level uh, don't see any way to change. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody want to go next? Okay, you're gonna come back in, Gil. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to react to what uh, what Doug said, if I if I may. 
Um, uh, Doug, thank you for this. I think it's very important. Um, um, speaking of CEOs and transitions, Paul Pullman, former CEO of Unilever, who's been one of the leaders in corporate sustainability for the past what, decade or so, has a book coming out this in the next few weeks with Andrew Winston uh, that will be speaking to this. That may be worth a look. Uh, more on point, a colleague of mine in Houston <clears throat> Uh, is organizing what's probably the first ever gathering of, of chief sustainability officers in the oil and gas industry in Houston, which is, of course, that's what that city is. Um, she was subscribed. The gathering is oversubscribed. There's a normal amount of eagerness to it. And this is the middle managers, if you will, uh, that you're talking about. Uh, we, I suspect that we may have an opening with her from that to talk with and potentially work with some oil and gas companies. Um, not sure if we should. I'm not sure. You know, I don't want to do lipstick on a pig bullshit. But if there's an opportunity to talk transition, um, that may be worth doing. And if that develops, I'd like to talk with you about bringing that scenario that that scenario work live into that room. I mean, not, not in the room with the gathering of all the CSOs, but in the engagements with some of those companies. So I think you're right. That's one of the ways to get their heads to move around it. Um, you know. Um, um, I don't think welfare is going to be enough here. I think it's going to take some hammers um, um, uh, because these guys are looking at stranded assets and you can do two things with stranded assets. You can run them down as long as possible until they fall off the cliff or you can strand them yourself and flip your business, both of which are very difficult strategies. They're obviously playing the first right now. Um, but, um, you know, it's 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 dicey territory, but I'd love to talk with you more about the scenario strategies with these guys. Good deal. Okay. It's scary. Yeah. It's a scary deal, but it needs to be done. Yeah, also to Doug's comment, um, the, the issue that uh, politicians are dealing with here is, is uh, increasing the cost to the base of pyramid uh, borders, right? And so the European Union has the same issue, really, and the organization or the NGO that I'm <clears throat> working with, Citizen Climate Lobby has been proposing the Energy Innovations and Carbon Dividend Act. So they would take the revenue stream coming from, from this carbon tax and pay it back out as in form of a dividend, which has the impact of, of uh, uh, a guaranteed minimum income, you know, because there, there has been this uh, this idea floating of creating a, a minimum income for everyone, so you have a baseline for people to participate in the economy, and so that that is probably uh, the way to go forward. It's right now in the reconciliation package uh, being negotiated in Congress. Um, so they already, I mean, there is a carbon tax coming in for sure, you know, so, but they're talking about exempting uh, unleaded fuel because they are, are worried about the border backlash uh, to increase, uh, to increase uh, oil, I mean, the, the, the gasoline, um, but the, this carbon fee and dividend is probably the, 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 the most practical way to move forward here from a, from a, from a voting perspective. Yeah, that. Yeah, it isn't uh, an issue to me with the carbon tax and the rebate is if we give rebate money to poor people with low incomes, aren't they going to spend it on energy? Well, that's that that is an argument, but maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, chances are um, that statistically the low in the low income sector may not even have a car, right? I mean, so or they they. Uh, their, their spending patterns are much, much less on energy than, than uh, 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 upper income levels. So there is going to be a disproportionate impact. Uh, higher income people will pay more into the tax pool than low income people because you know, we consume more. We have, uh, my gosh, I have three cars in the garage. Now we have the air condition running and all of those things that, that uh, the base of economy doesn't have. So they will get a disproportionate higher share of this of this carbon revenue than than anyone else. So they, 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 I, I, I posted uh, our website uh, in the link here. 
And if you read through it, there's oodles of statistics. And this has been embraced by over 100 economists, uh, around, I mean, the, the best Nobel Prize winning economists and, and uh, 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 no, people working in this field as, as the most uh, uh, palatable solution. Yeah. Well, I worry that um, I mean, I think that the that the the poor in the U.S. live in houses where air conditioning and heating are a major deal, and with increased uh, temperatures, the amount of uh, spending on air conditioning is going to increase. And what I see is the oil companies are trying to encourage us to go in that direction. Uh, we had to deal with health. We've got to work on making the in, in interiors of our habitation uh, successful at dealing with too much heat and too much cold. And that's going to take energy. So the oil companies are going to argue that we've got to keep uh, pumping in order to maintain the health of the civil population. Now they may do that, but then of course this this runs concurrently with uh, uh, innovations in the energy sector. But for example, in my sector um, in food uh, food and agriculture, now the number one cost input into the farm is synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which is made with natural gas, uh, and 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 pesticides made from oil. So by by increasing the and, and Agriculture contributes 24% of emissions, uh, which is equal to the electricity sector. In fact, uh, I'm going to post in a moment uh, uh, an, a new release from Project Drawdown where, where they you know, make the space case. So by increasing the cost to the farmer, um, they will push uh, uh, the sector out of using synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which is a disaster on so many levels. right? So, so this pricing will have an impact. And I think we can't just focus on the energy sector because the, the, you know, as I'm saying, trend, the same impact is caused by the uh, agricultural sector. A weird data point. <laughs> I don't know if any, any of you have spent any time in Alaska, um, but you know, I did 10, 10 or more years ago, I uh, taught some workshops and um, it was weird. I mean, I, 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 it felt weird. <laughs> and I was trying to get what's the weirdness here. And it was a kind of a, um, it, it was that oil subsidy. It was the fact that you could, you could go to a, a Best Western or a Holiday Inn and they would have a free beer happy hour and there'd be a lot of pickup trucks because there were, everybody was getting four or 5,000 a year from the oil dividend. And, you know, it, I'm not sure if, if you know it's it's probably a very messy uh, data source that you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to draw too much on it. But I I just just my subjective impression was leaning a little bit more towards Doug's view in that it looked to me like a lot of happy folks with pickup trucks uh, well, making well, free beer. <laughs> there, there, there are analysts who say that the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry exceed the defense budget. Uh, which itself is double the supposedly excessive uh, Biden infrastructure package. Uh, right. And so, you know, economically, you can't justify the subsidies there. You can justify them for, from political power, which is yeah. how the fossil fuel industry maintains itself. Um, you know, the cycle of money from taxpayers to the oil companies back to the Congress people who vote the subsidies. And so that's the loop. And that's what's got to be broken. We've got to kill the subsidies. Yeah. And, the, and that's not something that the fossil industry will volunteer to do. But politically, that's a critical piece of the story that both Doug and Klaus are telling. Yeah. And you know, arguably, you can you can play the capitalism card and say this is massively distorting the functions of the market. It's making capitalism not work. Blah blah blah. You can go that way with it, or a number of other ways. But that's uh, that's got to be a critical piece of the strategy, just to take those out. Because the you know the the guys at the pickup trucks in Alaska, they're getting dividends from the profits. The profits are subsidized. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you and I are paying for them filling their tax. Right, right. Okay, uh, we have a couple of people we have not yet heard from. Uh, anybody want to step forward or shall I just pick someone? Can I, just Stacey, you I, I just want to ask a question. Oh, I'm coming, go ahead. Yeah, coming from a beginner's mind, 
are there any subsidies to get the farmers to not use the oil, the the um the pesticides and stuff like that? I mean, if it were presented to the American public, which is now ready to fight anybody, and they do care about health and things like that, would there be a way to show the money that's being used right now to subsidize the oil company? What we could do with that money if we diverted it to farmers to not use those things that are bad for our health anyway? I mean, well, maybe I'll, I'll do my check in next because that's really uh, uh, on, on what I wanted to talk about. Um, so, we, we, we did uh, our webinar uh, on farm to fork community food systems. Now, we had 1,254 1, people registered for this thing. Um, uh, we had uh, over a hundred staffers from uh, from the legislative offices participate. So it was it was really uh, and it was mostly LinkedIn, all professional people from Europe, from Africa, Australia, and so on. So it, it was it was good. It was a good discussion. Um, yeah, the the there is no top down solution, you know, for agriculture. Um, the, the, it has to be community-based, bottom-up. But the, my, my next focus now is on the farm bill. I just launched a team with the Sierra Club and within uh, the, uh, business climate leaders to focus on farm bill 2022 because the, the farm bill in complexity and size equals the defense bill. It's amazing how, how many billions. Last year, uh, commodity growth in the U.S. to 40% of their income from government subsidies. But then the commodity growth, of course, are the ones that uh, are so destructive uh, in their impact on, on nature. So besides uh, a carbon tax that would increase the cost of fertilizer, uh, of, of the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, um, there are, there are other subsidies, such as um, uh, what they call crop insurance, right? So a farmer basically can't grow anything without uh, in, in the commodity area, which is you now soy and, and wheat and corn and, and so on, um, without having the, the insurance from uh, the government. So they're guaranteed a price, a base price. Um, and uh, if, if the market drops, then the government will pick up the difference. But the, the way this crop insurance is formulated, it forces them to grow a specific type of crop. So the idea that they can rotate their crop, for example, and put a cover crop on it, which you need to do in order to restore nutrients back into the soil, it's not, they don't allow the farmer to do that. It's the most perverted, insane incentive system you've ever seen. Um, top on the, the other thing is that the majority of the money actually goes to food subsidies. So food stamps, for example, uh, the child nutrition programs, school nutrition programs, and so on. And, the, and what they are pushing into, into these systems is junk food. I mean, it's all the processed food from, uh, from, from the industry instead of using that money. And these are, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars instead of using this money and allocating it to local sourced food, to fresh food and so on, it goes to, you know, the pizza is a vegetable kind of, uh, of thing. So the, the farm bill requires uh, uh, major, major reforms. And that's similar to the energy sector, you know, where you have these massive subsidies uh, uh, propping up an industry that we want to see uh, basically fade, fade out of existence. And so agriculture is, is very much the same thing. So, so what, uh, and, and then coming uh, to the personal pitch here, what I'm realizing is, um, you know, as I'm going into working with these NGOs, what we don't have is tech support. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I had to work really hard, you know, to get uh, the advertising out and to get the messaging out, particularly into social media, uh, the majority of our registrations came through LinkedIn, um, but I mean, the the the, the I, I don't know how to use uh, Twitter or Instagram and all this. I'm just not that proficient in it. So we we really need uh, social media support and we need uh, tech support you know, to to put that out. And if you think about the reach of a Sierra Club, we have four million members in there. 
You know, we have over 200,000 members at Citizen Climate Lobby, which are interacting, actively uh, engaged with the political process because we train them to become citizen lobbyists, right, to call their senator, call their legislator, and so on. Um, if we could have uh, uh, media support here, our reach could just, just explode. You know? And so one comment I made uh, in the, uh, or the, that sort of came out in the conversation in the webinar a couple of days ago was uh, with Sophie. You know, Sophie, the young lady, uh, uh, has uh, been a founding member of the Menus of Change Initiative with Harvard University and the uh, Culinary Institute of America. And we started talking about children, right? Uh, uh, young people. And I was mentioning that, you know, we need to activate the greater Thunberg generation because these guys are so on fire, but they're shooting blanks, right? I mean, they, they, they don't really have traction uh, in impacting uh, uh, the, the, uh, this, this vital part of the economy. And, uh, and she was saying, I mean, when you look at young people, they are high up on, we have to engage with climate change, but they don't make the link between the food you put in your mouth is contributing to climate change, right? And you could change that. So to, to educate you know, this, this sector uh, uh, of, the, of the population requires social media intervention, particularly in channels that I don't even know uh, exist, right? Because uh, they're talking on platforms that I'm not familiar with, and, and I don't know how the structure that media outreach. So anyone, if, if anyone is inspired you know, to, to engage with something like this, we could really need some help. Thank you, Klaus. And uh, please, I'm guessing the group would very much like to stay informed about the status of the uh, agriculture bill. And if there are particularly egregious points we should focus on or particularly positive points, we could uh, you do our own advocacy for. And also, uh, I'll scan the uh, the young people I know to, for a for a, a TikTok fluent uh, advocate <laughs> to, to maybe put them in touch with you. TikTok uh, would be amazing, right? I mean, yeah. they're not already um, when you go on TikTok and you put in climate change. You now there are some amazing contributions of young people uh, who are on fire, but they are they are talking generically about climate change, right? That is not a campaign. That, yeah. that says, you know, look at your food, look at what you buy, who do you buy your food from? So because they're not, they're simply not educated you now on, on these issues. On yeah, the other systems. Okay, well, this has been good. We're moving along. We've got, uh, I think we've got four more people who we have not, who've yet to hear from. Um, and uh, you know, Eric, you wanna go next? If I could. Um... I don't know if I can share anything on the screen. That's actually possible. So it's, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't done it. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Apparently, okay. sometimes it's not uh, possible for guests to do that. So um, it's very bad demo time. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> I, um, I want to show you, I, I, I'm going to try to explain what. I have been researching is about in as practical as possible way. This is mostly graphs that I'm going to show, um, but it, I think it filters into all the discussions that's been going on in, in OGM. So I just want to start somewhere and for the moment, maybe suck at it and gradually get better. Um, but it starts really simple. Um, principle is what if you have a kind of an outliner or the brain software but one that would allow for any kind of thing to be mapped in a as easy way as possible um, and the, the very basic idea is to have a kind of network of networks that gathers all the channels communication channels and adds them adds them to an active knowledge map for instance if I if I listen to, um, there's many more steps in this, but I, I really don't. I think it would take too much time. But yeah. basically, yeah. if you if you got like, it's kind of what um, 
Vincent is doing, he's, he's gathering a lot of channels of people like uh, which channels is, or which products using within which theme. Mm -hmm. But what I'm then working on is kind of an interface that's as simple as possible. It's just one view and people can just relate anything to anything like in the brain but then it's organized around categories. And these categories are, for instance, um, you could add a topic, you could add a help desk item, or you could do some governance, which is uh, voting. Uh, you do curation, evaluation, review, governance and decision-making comes again in the same picture or knowledge management. It could be a location, a geo area, a time data, a number data. It could be a person, a group, an org, a network. It could be a service, a product, an event, an opportunity. It can be a project, a vision, a goal, a task, a to-do list. Um, it could be any attachment or embedding of a website. And then this is a lot of information. I would guess to somebody who really doesn't know what <laughs> what I'm talking about, but it's basically a system where you could post anything and can connect, be connected to each other. And the interface looks a bit like this. You have, for instance, this is really basic, very simple. There's a current crisis in Afghanistan. There's a type which is called orgs. And when orgs, you've got NGOs, you've got contact details and the project that these NGOs are doing. You've got all the groups that are there. You've got analysis, there's articles, there's a timeline of events, there's maps and monitors, and per city, there's a monitor for a crisis in Afghanistan. That's just one example, but it could be global warming. It could be any kind of issue. And you would see all the connections that, it, that are going on. Like, okay, the US government has these um, projects running. These agencies are working on these projects and then can be linked to all the um, uh, all the possible channels that they use. It, it would be much more easy to see who to join where, but also to see a common way of thinking about these issues. As we are talking in a, in a Zoom right now about these issues, it's a very limited amount of people. And we try to understand how to get out the information. This system is kind of as simple as, a, as an outline, a simple outline, but you just basically change the type of a category. Okay, I, I will add an organization. I will add a project. I will add a to-do. And it allows you to filter through all of it in the easiest possible way. This is just one interface. Even Facebook has different views, but you could do most of it just by an outline. I have no idea how clear all of this is. <laughs> it's my current attempt. Well, but uh, yeah. I mean, it, a druther or a wish I would have, not only for your system, but for some other uh, systems. Uh, Mark isn't here today. I mean, various people uh, are doing, doing this kind of thing. And I would love it if a, if a funder had the kind of vision to say, well, yeah, I mean, don't look at this as a self-powered uh, innovation. To, to give it a real test, you need to pay for somebody to be the kind of info butler and so that somebody can arrive at this thing and they're not lost. They don't have to find their own way. There's somebody there who says, what is it? What kind of information would you like to either add or find? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll do that. And, if, and, and you need a little bit of time of that sort of thing going and then step back and say, so- Hello. Uh, did it, did it really add uh, meaning? Did it really add uh, ease of collaboration? And uh, those, are, those are the important questions, but well, to give it, it doesn't, yeah, as far as I understand, it doesn't exist yet. I see a lot of uh, platforms, but they have a certain amount of levels and their interface is so, it's Some slow point. to go from one place to another. And what I tried to change is, what I didn't tell, for instance, is my categories, there's a maximum of nine categories in one thing. And you basically have a code uh, for anything you would add. How as a category. can you prove to me that you're oh, wait, part Doug? of US customers? Doug, if you could mute, please. Uh, 
<laughs> probably as a way to mute it. Look, what you're doing is very scammy and you can scaring, mute it. scaring yeah. people, and you should get a real job. You know. uh, when you participants, and then you can. Mute uh, you should be able to mute him. If you uh, the yeah. admin, you could. Yeah. Do I yeah, take one? Looking at my menus. Who is the admin? Again? Look at his screen and see if there's blue box with a little dots. That see a blue box. It says chat. <laughs> oh, okay. Go to, uh, go to participants. Hey, Doug. Doug. You can mute yourself while you're not speaking to us, okay? <laughs> thank you. Happens. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's 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 great to do that kind of work, and and I hope that that your work like that and other people's work like that can get a level of support that there can be a navigator. To, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. That's something some people are working on already, and I, I find it most difficult to find funding for this kind of thing. And oh yeah, as many others do. Um, there's just yeah, it's <laughs> but okay. that's been for a while. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. It's a good start. Uh, okay, we have about uh, we're a little past the hour. Uh, we have a few more people that we have not heard from, and, and some of you may need to go early. If anybody needs to go early or wants to jump in next, uh, please raise your hand or put up your, uh, your hand signal. Uh, Allison and uh, Shimon, I think, are both. Uh, no, you're saying no, Allison? No, I can speak. Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, good morning. I uh, had a lot, lots, lots of stuff moving around this morning, so it was nice to be able to wait but there certainly is a lot that I missed yeah and it seems that you know we have all of our brains have different ways of uh, approaching problems for sure yeah or approaching solutions actually which is what the purpose of problems are but really what we're thinking about when we're coming into problems is we're looking at solutions um, and one of the things that has come up for me Gosh, you know, as you all know, I'm a teacher. And so when I'm looking at how to approach history again, I never quite feel like I'm at, I'm doing the best job that I could be. I don't feel, you know, we've got our textbooks and I, I teach US history and world history and then economics. And so, you know, there's a lot of subjects and really do have a good amount of time to reinvent the wheel for all of these things. Um, but for sure, I feel like a huge story is missing. Um, and that continues to be missing when it comes to our public narratives. You know, like uh, I really love teaching about colonial history of the US. And I really, I really love the part about how this community kind of untethered, um, well, not untethered at all, tethered to immersed, it's the second nation, right? Immersed in the in, in the traumas of where, from where they came. Mm -hmm. And in that trying to build a new, but certainly still attached to the, the traumas that they had gone along with of oppression and the whole, the whole system. And yet there was a lot that was done with the community currencies. And that is a huge story for me and how to reinvent an economy and reinvent modes of trade and, and reinvent these abilities to create the lives that we want. It may seem irrelevant to you, but I, I think it's exactly of the essence. And, and because we go and we blaze forward really quickly into the validity of a war and the heroism of a war. Um, and, that, and we haven't stopped. So for my education, you know, um, I had parent, wonderful parents and um, wonderful opportunities to go and see Washington DC and the National Monument and all the monuments that exist there um, for war. Sorry, it's just gonna give my mom credit for being powerfully emotional to show me that that was a moving thing, you know? And that war machine hasn't slowed down at all. We're not putting it 
up in terms of seeing something and saying, look at what we've learned, it just keeps growing. And I look back at, you know, this Afghanistan thing, well, certainly a pattern was 9-11 that we didn't look at the complexity of the situation and we didn't ask why. We didn't ask, we didn't ask. That was the same thing that might be in common with Columbus and all of the explorers, they didn't ask. Curiosity was not demonstrated. When it comes to, um, anything like the patterns of the 2016 election, the pattern there was um, who to blame? What is it about our solution making that's needing to solve problems on behalf of others? What is it about our, our efforts at solution making that is so dominating? That's where I think that we've got a lot there to look at on when I've got to figure it out for other people. And so for me, that, that money thing really comes into play because we can talk about these billions and billions of dollars with a quadrillion dollars that are up in derivatives. And I've like got this sense right now, I keep using the term Voldemort money because, because it's this like thing that's kind of like barely alive. You know, if, you've, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, Voldemort was barely alive and he would have to suck the blood of unicorns to be able to stay alive. And that's how we've designed our money. We've designed our money to just barely stay alive. It, it, it has devalued to such a tiny percent that the only way to grow it is with compound interest, which is basically converting everything that's living and wonderful and beautiful and converting it into some commodity and siphoning it up into this growing toxic machine. And it keeps going from that. And so I, I, let it die. Let it die. Stranded assets. It's a big deal, the stranded assets. What is it? Is it a big deal? I mean, we really logically have got to look at it from a new way. I don't see these youth because I'm working with them. I don't see them as shooting blanks. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's out there, but when, um, and yeah, we could, we could work together. There's a, you know, get the Sierra Club to be partnering with, um, you know, whatever, the Sunshine, whatever group is for climate change. There's sunrise there be, movement. Yeah. the Sunrise, thank you. Um, there could be some huge partnerships and things like that. For myself, I feel like, um, one of the most important things for me is creating the world that we want instead of fighting against the one that we don't. I think that'd be pretty neat to be spending some time doing that. And, and so I shared this really great um, paper that, that some friends that are, that are um, connected with, uh, Leanne, um, Asher of Bard University, who teaches a lot about community currencies, and she's a part of that. And Esther Bernaga, she does a lot with community currencies. So that arc-bound climate adaptation and self-resilience, it's a really beautiful book, a lot of solutions that are in there. And I thought that it was interesting just to come across this of how many people, myself included, especially this last year, suffering it as a single mom alone and just the way that our economy drives that. That's really, it's really, really hard and depressing. Just to say, I don't mean to, you know, but just to sympathize with how difficult it is to be isolated. It's not human. It's not what we want to do. The way that we think about problems is isolating. The way we think about our wealth is isolating. We have an oxymoronic language of private equity is an oxymoron. Private equity. Are you kidding me? Right? If we privatize, when we privatize, our problems, it's also isolating. So we, we're, you know, I want, I don't know. I blah, 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 is how my mind works a little bit too much and not, too, not enough, you know. Yeah, yeah let's in right now, but um, just to, to draw attention to that, we can sequester our money and really focus on solutions. And honestly, I think we can get really far 
by making solutions that are that are local. Thank you. Yeah, Alison, that's I've been since my retirement 10 years ago working in this field, you know, of sustainability and regeneration and so on. And you can't change the system, you can't change top down. When you look at and, and you know, we are engaged in the legislative process in Washington and with politicians. The problem is that you, you have a, a, an upper middle class and elites who want the system to do exactly what it's doing. They don't want that change, right? And they control, uh, 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 I mean, pe good people, right? I mean, you have local business people, they own uh, 10 McDonald's stores and so on. They don't want the food system to change. They make good money the way it is. So the system has to be rebuilt from the ground on up, you know, and that's where the action is. Um, and that, that's where you can put realities in place. And then top down, you know, we can build a support structure you know, of information, training, tools, and so on, that can help these local efforts, this farm to fork community food system that can roll out into other applications of community building. No, that's that's basically the only way I, I I find is practical. And what Gil is saying, yeah, maybe not activate young people, but support them absolutely. I mean, when I look at the efforts of these NGOs, they're good people, right? I mean, they really are uh, working at community level and have been for years. I mean, they're fantastic, but they don't have any tools. They don't. They don't have a Slack channel, you know, they don't have, they don't know how to build a website. I mean, basic, basic stuff. So we're building all these wonderful tools and you go, well, tools are fine, but what are you going to do with them? What, are, what who for, you know, who's going to use them? So, so for a tool builder, you know, you have to attach yourself to someone who's using these tools and, and, uh, and puts them to practical use. So that, that's you know, my frustration really, because I know we could supercharge this thing if we had support structures in place. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Allison. It's a it's and Klaus. Uh, I, I appreciate the the integration of passion and thoughtfulness um, that you're bringing to the conversation. And uh, of course, you know that doesn't finish the conversation. It it opens up as many issues as it as it raises. Um, but it certainly uh, gives us all something to think about um, and experience. Uh, and I see that Eric wants to jump in and we've got three more people and, and we're doing pretty well in terms of our, uh, our timing. So uh, Eric, did you wanna comment on this last? Uh, yeah, I okay. wanted to ask Alison, is there like, through all what you shared, is there like, there might be multiple questions. Is, is there like one essential question Can we all get on board for designing our economic ecosystems towards a aligned North Star? I think that it might be possible so that we hold each other accountable for whether or not we're reaching those um, goals together. That becomes measurable and vestible. Okay. That becomes that could becomes a future asset. And so if we can if we can create solutions that we're recognizing together, we want to build businesses together, we want to work on projects together, we want to, we want to cultivate these ecosystems together towards, um, towards peace and prosperity and regeneration and well-being. Unless we do that, those things can be differently identified throughout time and space, um, yet they still become markers. Otherwise, like a stranded asset on even itself, just, just ditch those assets. Yeah, they're meaningless. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is there a? So, yeah. I, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I I like it, and as I start to think about it, I um. I think in terms of scale, as in not not how does it scale up, but actually how do we scale it down? In other words, how do we make um. Fifty people, <laughs> or half a town, mm -hmm. into a, a really good working laboratory. Um, yeah. Yeah, with um, with a little we, and a community currency and uh, getting some projects going, yeah, and yeah. be held accountable towards a purpose, a collective purpose that's measured. Yeah, yeah. And then you get people looking at data because they're incentivized to do so. So the data and what we learn becomes useful and meaningful 
be, because it's providing us the feedback that that we're actually invested in mm -hmm. together. So I do think I do think that it's absolutely possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to try to hijack the conversation. There's a there's a I have a vision of of the incremental integration of a of a community currency with a fiat currency. I don't see them replacing, you know, the whole, the whole Bitcoin thing is crazy. But I think, I think a stable digital currency that's like green bucks and it's low and it has certain parameters, this thing called demurrage, you know, which means you, 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 there's no advantage to accumulating it. And, uh, you know, there's incentives for local food, local uh, reducing carbon impact, et cetera, et cetera. You can do a lot of interesting experiments with a, a, a green currency particularly if you don't try to completely replace the fiat and you look at it as, well, look, we got this fiat economy and it's running it. It's running it's in a way. It's not necessary, I think, to have the conversation about trying to replace it because it's so yeah. massive right now that really what you're trying to do is just get something to be usable, right? Yeah, and, and so supplementary. If, I'm, if yeah. I'm planting a food forest, I'm not going to go into the food forest and cut down all of the trees, but I'm going to cultivate what does grow and yeah. what does thrive eventually those trees will live through their cycle and become more useful dead than they were alive as far as you know how they're feeding the ecosystem and how many living organisms are on them yeah. right and so yeah. and so i think that it doesn't need to be a situation of attack and dominate but it does can be one of cultivate what grows and and it's the same thing using the garden or the ecosystem metaphor many multiple purposes, right? But when you can align towards a similar goal, you're gonna need different different ways to get there. So so even in one community, you could have multiple different currencies. Right. And still be effective. Okay, yeah. I like it. We have a few people we haven't heard from yet. Um, Mark, uh, Shimon, uh, Julian, do one of you wanna come in? You're muted, uh, Shimon. I can come in. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, it's nice to be back and uh, participating in this group. Uh, I actually am working on something that addresses many of the topics that were raised here. First about food, actually, I'm, I've been listening to the Atlantic Festival this morning, and they had a conversation about food insecurity versus nutrition insecurity, and a whole kind of conceptual model of from the White House to communities, how to engage with that issue. And I found that to be very, very interesting. It, apparently, it's also connected to an area that I'm very interested in, which is the whole issue of social determinants of health, which is becoming a very important element of public policy right now. What I'm interested in is essentially, I think along the lines of what Allison was talking about, uh, is essentially thinking of a different paradigm to think about what we need to do as citizens. And the paradigm that I'm working on is the salutogenic paradigm, which is instead of creating disease, which is the healthcare system is what's all about, and some of the ecosystems that you discussed, how do we create a salutogenic individual community society? So I actually trained with the person who came up with the concept. So I'm sort of like emotionally attached to it because he really inspired me. And now that I'm three months re retired, I'm working full time on that. So what am I doing in that regard? If you would like, I mean, I can just share and share my screen because to Klaus's point about uh, technology, I mean, I'm using a model that thinks about startups. You know, a startup is something you start with vision or version 1.0, you do it very locally, friends and family, you try it out, you learn from it, and then you iterate, and then you scale it up. One of the things that I'm trying to do, and again, there is a lot of good technology out there. I'm using the Wix platforms to create like on a community level, what is it that people can understand about their community? And it's just not necessarily the environment because every community defines their problems in a different way. So for example, in the discussion in the Atlantic this morning, people who are talking about doing that, it's like nothing without us 
when you're doing some, something about us. Some communities, the biggest problems they have is stray dogs. I mean, we may think it's like, you know, the electric uh, grid or, you know, like deserts of, you know, food, but the biggest problem stifling people's well-being is stray dogs. So the question is, how do you embrace the community to understand what, and then how do you match that with what the funding is and the energy is? The project that I'm doing actually is self-funded because I don't believe that when you try to get funding from an organization doing grants and things like that, it really helps in the long term. What I've seen with professional organization is the leadership has their board mandated project. They do it for a year or two, and then they move into something else. There's never continuity. There's never learning from the project. So my whole thing is developing it myself with a group of other people. For example, how to think about education from zero to university in a salutogenic way. And I've engaged with some people who are in the education field. There is some writing about that. How do you translate it then into a community level? So the people I've engaged with here, I live in Montgomery County, Philadelphia area, is the local library. The local library, which is an anchor institution, is very dedicated to sort of like the John Dewey concept of how can we help people be better citizens. And by introducing already a ready-made package, it's a really helpful way of doing it. The other organizations, and again, I don't believe in the idea that because things have been done a certain way for decades, and certainly you can understand the incentive system, we can't change that. My idea is how do you leverage it with an understanding and sort of like reshift the power. So for example, hospitals, because they're nonprofit, have to do a three-year cost, uh, not a cost, community benefit assessment. The way it's done out of the 4,000 hospitals in the US is usually they engage with a few community partners. They come up with a list of like diabetes, obesity, mental health, uh, addiction in the community. They have pretty numbers. They send it to the boards. But the second part is what are they doing about it? They never do anything about it. So the question is, how do you leverage that? You go to the boards and define a structure where the community works together to identify what it is that they see are the community health benefits. In some communities, it could be that kids are not going to school. In other communities, it could be kids don't have anything to do and they overdose because they're spiritually deprived. So again, the question is, how do we leverage community benefit in order to really understand on a community level what's going on? The Lowen Institute just came out with a rating of all the hospitals in America along the line of what they're doing to engage communities with equity. So for example, if you look at a hospital that's located, you know, like next to a community that's got the highest mortality rate, the CEO of that hospital may be making $12 million a year, which would support quite a lot of teachers, after school programs, and things of that kind. How do we sort of like think about that and bring it to people's awareness so that things can be shifted? So that's the kind of stuff I'm working on. Uh, I have been connecting it, and again, I'm very connected to the idea of uh, how do we think about theories of change? And my theory of change is having a goal. I think Allison mentioned there or someone else mentioned that. But the goal is instead of GDP, how do we create a gross flourishing scales? And within the gross flourishing scale, what I'm trying to do is have a five year plan towards the 20, 250th anniversary of the US of. Uh, returning to the whole idea of pursuit of happiness. What does it mean? And there's a number of initiatives going that way. So what I've done is I've sort of like broken down the next five years to looking at a salutogenic framing of pre-birth and maternal health, children till the age of 12, 12 to 18, 18 to 65, 65 and over. And every year looking at what should be the indicators of gross flourishing that lead to happiness, 
what should be within the community setting. Let's do an assessment of what's going on and so on. If I have a minute, I can show you the website because I really do think that we do have the technology. I have been working on uh, the opiate epidemic. One of the things that I've done is a platform for communities to really understand what's happening in terms of the opiate you know, like issues and overdoses, which is tied to diseases of despair. And within that, people can just download the website and adjust it to their community. And within that, it has a list of all their senators, congressmen, councilmen, a board of directors, and things of that kind. So if I can just share for a minute. So I start out with a whole issue of a toolbox. And again, it's about how to let citizens think that they're empowered. The piece of salutogenesis, which is critical, is people need a sense of coherence. One of the biggest problems is when you feel marginalized, when you feel empty, that you can't make a change. That's when you feel really despondent, depressed, and usually angry. Hannah Arendt talks about it as one of the roots of fascism or authoritarianism, is feel alienated and then someone mobilizes your anger. So parts of you know, the, the, the way one needs to think about it is your toolbox is having checklists, data, tracers, and ecosystem. I'm not gonna go into it. And then giving people tools to essentially, how does it affect their lives? For example, in the opiate epidemic, how they can engage in ways to become much more resilient, things like that, get social and get political. So for example, in the get political piece, is like, what can you do to engage with it in your political ecosystem? How do you understand it? Who are the people in the political ecosystem? And so on and, for, and so forth. And then people can participate in different ways. Then the other piece, which is very, uh, I think, crucial, is giving people citizen briefs. Citizen brief. And I actually reached out to Doug to try to sort of like have a conversation with him about some of the media piece, because I think that the media were giving him so much uh, attention because of misinformation. But the role of the media is to make better citizens, make better democracy. So the question is how to do it. And I sort of came up with a concept of citizen briefs, which is connected to you know, like uh, Brandeis's idea of citizen brief. And then you create a citizen brief about various topics. It borrows from the Wikipedia mo model, but for example, issues like inequality, issues like uh, declaration of war, like what Ellison was saying. You know, how can we create like a structure so that when the next thing comes up, like whether we want to go to war in Iran or eva evaluate uh, uh, Venezuela, how do we think about it as citizens? The environment, how, you know, so essentially, you know, these citizen briefs are tied into a bigger picture and are part of, you know, the disease, you know. And again, it, it goes into like a lot of conversation connected to Wikipedia, allowing people to have, you know, conversation about how to engage with that issue. So this is, you know, what I call the citizen brief and my strategic plan, which includes that theory of uh, change, includes like these four pillars. One is like political, which is what are the four, the first principles that unite us as a nation? And it goes more beyond that globally, like in terms of liberalism, in terms of why, you know, first principles, you know, that led to the US and things of that kind and gross flourishing product. What should we be including to indicate a gross flourishing product? And the thing that I'm setting out, because I think you have to have an organizing structure, I'm setting out for our January 2022, what I call the Jefferson Center for Salutogenesis, which is gonna include, again, various undertaking for salutogenesis within the healthcare system. And I'm working with people in Europe and around the country here, looking at tools to translate what I was talking about into real things, like the community assessments that hospitals have to do how do we have a structure that looks at salutogenic communities, which then the hospitals are judged by? 
universities, same thing. So it's connect, connected clinical care, then personal resources. How do we establish community? Salutogenesis, there's a lot of work on that. Salutogenesis in the military, I'm working with some people in Israel that have actually established within the Israeli military because of this stressors, a salutogenic approach to well-being, a salutogenesis in schools. I think Allison last time talked about it. A, how do we create a salutogenic agenda? And I'm talking to a number of people about what would it look like for kids to learn how to understand themselves, how to be coherent within their community, utilizing the fact that they're indigenous, upper middle class, they're African-American, they have, you know, like gender identity issue. I mean, there's tools to do that. How do we incorporate that into the educational system? And how do then we advocate to make it happen? And then the salutogenesis at work is a huge area. There's a lot of consulting being done. There's a European group that's working on it and things of that kind. So right now what I'm working on is like developing more intensely uh, uh, writings about the salutogenic paradigm healthcare as an institution like the American Medical Association, NIH, various other so like national organization are really struggling to figure out what they need to do moving forward. And one of the problems they have is the paradigm, the pathogenic paradigm is not really working. So my hope is so like to develop this beyond just so like a salutogenic paradigm that is just an article in a paper, but a whole kind of proposal. And that's part of what we've been working on is like a proposal for salutogenic paradigm in healthcare. So that's what I'm up to uh, these days. Uh, Thank you. That's, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a humbling experience because of the scope of your work on this. It's really, it's really substantial. It's really amazing. And I, and we got the, we got the link now in the uh, chat. And by the way, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if, how this is done in other days, but I'm going to go through the chat and I'm going to load it into Mattermost. Um, uh, if, and uh, anyway, so all that will be available. But yeah, but this is a, this is a very substantial piece of work. Well, uh, my, my thinking is, again, we all talk about what we talk about, but we don't have an organizing framework. Yeah, the environment is a problem. Everyone has their data. But what I'm trying to do is go back to why do we have government? And government essentially the single role is for the happiness of the people. And that's agreed upon by conservatives and Republicans and libertarians, anyone who is interested in you know, political theory, that's where we start. So whether you're liberal, conservative or whatever, that's where we start. And the problem is, is that the constitution, which still most people hold up as the organizing DNA for the country, did not come up with a user's manual. So the way I like to frame it is that I'm actually using or creating a user's manual for that. So right. again, if people are interested in learning more, this is a little overwhelming. The suggestion that someone had to have a guide to that. I mean, I've certainly am taking that into account because my mind is like within the hedge and the fox. I'm definitely like a fox. So I'm like all over the place. Uh, so anyway, so that's where I'm at. And my question to everyone is, what are you doing the next five years? And then so like inviting people to this project. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, all right. I, I, I don't know <laughs> how to do an, an encore to that. Um, but we've got the link. Uh, we have a view of what the site looks like. Uh, definitely, definitely deserves a closer look and examination. And uh, we've got about another uh, ten minutes on our on our normal schedule. Uh, would anyone? We, we haven't heard from uh, Julian or Mark. Um, would either of you like to to uh, come in and uh, talk to us today, or, or shall we? Have, uh, yeah. I actually don't have much to report. I'm battling with Neo4j at the moment, so I can continue working on my knowledge bases. And uh, sorry for the split attention this morning. The kitten has been unusually demanding, and so I've had to run back and forth between different rooms. So. Okay. <clears throat> All right. 
Mark, did you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, that was so, so uh, shaman. It's wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. That was my reaction too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can just imagine the amount of work and effort that you put into this. Um, it's, it's amazing. I think it's very, very needed. Um, I feel there is there is always uh, in in many of the conversations that we're having around you know all these different topics that have all, all have to do with I think our you know both ability and and hope to um, to live or the next generation um, a place to live and the the idea that we all struggling with, I think has to do with um, energy and how we transitioned about 300 years ago from uh, um, a human powered economy to something that would be powered by fossil fuels. Um, and, and, and this idea of uh, how we are now heading towards a contraction of our economies because it's becoming more and more expensive uh, to extract fossil fuel. It seems to be escaping a lot of people. The fact that the trajectory we're heading towards um, in terms of climate change is only going to add stress the answer is our ability to uh, adapt to this new environment. And our ability to adapt to this new environment is what that made us human for, you know, 300,000 years. Um, I'm wondering when we speak of systems, how we integrating this aspect we can say, you know, we just need to build a new system and that will replace the old system where it never worked that way. There is always chaos at one point. There is always a contraction, a tension, but it doesn't seem that we, we, we're taking this into account. And I, I posted uh, here um, someone that I've been listening to lately. Um, he's a brilliant French guy, um, Jean-Marc Jancovici. And he speaks of, of about this, about the, the, that trajectory of, we're talking about growth. We, all, we will always, we, it doesn't seem that we want to move away from, from, from that rhetoric, right? But there, there is a clear dichotomy between our current system and the fight against climate change. When, when I hear, you know, about us uh, uh, or eventually, you know, empowering some people to, to, to have uh, a bigger say in terms of uh, what large corporations could do, I'm just wondering, but aren't they doing that at Davos all the time, like every year? Aren't they talking about all this? It doesn't seem to be changing. So there is, there is incremental changes that we see, and Unilever is a perfect example of that but they're not happening fast enough. So the trajectory we're heading towards is not going to change. It doesn't seem logical. And, and, and the number of wars that we're having at the moment have all to do with controlling natural resources and nothing else. So that's where we are. So how do we move away from that? I, I, I have no idea, but I'm just pointing at this at this dichotomy um, that I feel very often happen in our groups and, and many groups that I'm part of, and even myself, I'm, I'm at loss as really uh, uh, what could be done. We talk about uh, um, eventually having some, uh, some, some, some types of subsidies to help people uh, prepare to, to these changes, right? Um, that has been happening in France for the last 20 years, 30 years. And if you look at how people have been spending that money, well, it's mostly on food and cars because everybody needs transportation. So the, 
contraction happens in many of these economies and how they ac access energy. So France is compared to Spain, Italy and Portugal and Greece, uh, which, which probably is a, the most obvious example of a country that is so dependent on fossil fuel. At one point of that contraction in 2007, 2008, it went bankrupt, almost, yeah. you know? And France has a difference that it has only a, a, a much smaller dependence on fossil fuel because it's mostly nuclear powered. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about nuclear, right? As, you know, one solution that could help with this. But so there is this, this, this dichotomy between the both. And I just wanted to, to share that with you and, and introduce um, this, this gentleman, um, Jankovici. So I posted a YouTube uh, video that in English, um, mm -hmm. if you guys are interested in that. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's no, obviously there's no answer, quote unquote answer that we're all like saying, oh yes, that's it. Let's all go in that direction on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, very smart, very well-informed, very plugged in group here. You know, we're saying, some of us are saying, I think, I think Allison, a few others saying, well, I know a few people <laughs> and at least I can, we can pull out of the standard model of consumption. We can pull back on our, energy use, pullback on our participation in corporate food, that kind of crap. Um, you know, there's, we're not, not geographically contiguous. You know? no, ab 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 absolutely. And I, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same boat. I'm, yeah. You know, we all try to, so, to, 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 to be yeah. thinking of this, but very often what I'm saying is that very often there is, there is this dichotomy between the two. Right. Right. We, we need to, in but that was the first energy. part. The, yes. The first part is you and your friends, uh, me and my friends, let's pull back. Then let's see, okay, how synergistic can we be? And then there's different exits from our, from our isolation. There's a political exit. If we are so motivated and so informed, so well informed by like some of the people here, we're very plugged into the uh oh, John, I don't know. We're going to exert against the political, you know, nonprofit fundraising. There's, there's that kind of an exit or extension or growth, if you want. It's a, it's a weird kind of growth, you know. It's not, it's not conventional growth. We're actually reducing our net consumption, drastically reducing our net consumption of, of carbon-based stuff. But we might be growing our amount of, um, what, a social appreciation, our music, <laughs> Whatever Gil's got some ideas about that. Um, you know, it's just it's just a very loose loose model of what's going on. Gil, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just real briefly, because I know we're at time. Um, the what we can do individually and with our neighbors and friends and communities is critically important for sure. That wonderful Arundhati quote that most of us know: "There is another world coming on a quiet day." I can hear her breathing. Yeah, uh, is the second half of the quote. I've never seen the first half till last week. The first half says exactly what we've just been talking about. Uh, and that they need us more than we need them. So, you know, withdraw from that, all well and good. And at the same time, we're in the grips of the massively subsidized, you know, industrial war machine system that we were talking about early in the call. And me eating organic food, you know, provides some market pressure on that, but it doesn't transform that. Um, and, um, and there's very pragmatic constraints. It was also someone talked about before, you know, you can tell a low income person to not use energy and give them some money, but if they are in, in a job system and a transportation system that exists now, they don't have a whole lot of choice. For us, the next move in our home is to electrify the home and that requires uh, contractors who know how to do that and who know how to put in heat pump, uh, heating and cooling systems. And there's a dearth of people who know how to do that. And there's no organized way to find them or vet them. So, you know, me as a smart, informed, knowledgeable about this stuff guy have a hard time doing that. Yeah. What about regular what about regular homeowners or renters? It's not just the money, Allison. It's like the training of the trades and the organizational system. So yeah, I can do what I can in my own life, but we have systemic issues that we also have to deal with. And this whole, you know, it all interconnects. Um, but there we go. Anyhow, okay. thank you, everybody.
All right. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all. Great conversation. I'm going to leave the uh, room open long enough for at least for me to copy the chat so I can uh, enter it into the matter most. That, that's that been a kind of a, a leaky, uh, yeah. leaky aspect of our record keeping. Uh, so I'll, I'll make sure that that doesn't disappear uh, when, we, when we close the room. And uh, Thank you all and look forward to seeing you right, next week, but also maybe on some of the uh, intervening uh, meetings. Okay, take care. Yes. <laughs>